Hallelujah. 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 Christ was crucified. And on Easter, in our memories, Christ is going to be crucified again. What are some of the lessons from the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? So Jesus was traveling from Bethany. He was going towards Jerusalem. And the Bible says in Mark 11, 12, that the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if there was any fruit in it. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season of the figs. Then he said to the fig tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. So on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Beloved, this was my quiet time this morning leading up to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was leaving Bethany, the Bible says, to go to Jerusalem, his place of purpose, where he was going to wait in the Garden of Olives for God's will to be accomplished. He knew what God's will was, but he was going to intercede on the manner in which God had ordained that he should die by crucifixion. So as he was leaving Bethany, the Bible says, Jesus was hungry. Now, Bethany was where Lazarus and her two sisters were. So as I mulled over the verse or meditated on it, I thought, surely Jesus would have eaten before leaving Bethany. But this time, maybe he didn't stop by Mary and Martha. It brought something to my mind that sometimes when we don't get to do our little acts of service, it leads to a loss or a temporary, some temporary type of discomfort in the kingdom. Because even though Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived in Bethany, this time perhaps Jesus didn't pass through or it was in the morning. So he was going on his journey and the Bible says he was hungry. The second point is that Jesus was hungry. So it reminded me of God's promise that we have a high priest who is touched with all the feelings of our infirmities. That was very heartwarming to me that God sent his son as a man so that he would feel what you and I feel and therefore to make him a merciful and a faithful high priest according to the book of Hebrews. So just as you and I get hungry, Jesus was also hungry. So God knows where we are at, and God knows the lack, God knows the discomfort, God knows the pain that we sometimes walk through as believers. Now the account goes on to say he came to a fig tree. When he looked at the fig tree, it had only leaves. It didn't have any fruit. And Jesus cursed the fig tree. What was the curse? He didn't say, you are cursed. He didn't even say, wither. What he said was, may no one eat fruit from you any longer. Wow, that sense shivers down my spine. I got to know that God's curse is when you are not fruitful. God's curse is when no one eats from your fruit. So for those of us who are very self-centered, 
for those of us who think that life is just about me, myself and I, I think this biblical passage is, is knocking at the door of our hearts. Because Jesus cursed the fig tree and said, May no one eat fruit of you. Beloved, when God calls you and gives you something that others can benefit from, it is a blessing. And it means that the blessing of the Lord is on our lives when that is happening. But when you are cursed, first of all, you don't bring forth any fruit. Forth any fruit. And then also, you, you are not there to have fruit when it's needed. Now the Bible says that it wasn't even the season for fruiting for fig trees. But Jesus wasn't concerned about that. He was concerned about the moment of his hunger and what the fig tree had to offer when maybe there was a need or maybe when God needed fruit from the fig tree. That was quite a profound lesson. I learned that it's not necessarily having fruit in my season, but having fruit when God calls me somewhere to be fruitful and to touch lives that I have to touch or to meet needs that are godly. Not all needs are God mandated to be met, but this particular need was mandated by God to be met. What do I mean? King David wanted to build the temple to the glory of God, but God said no. You shed too much blood. Solomon, your son, will build it. So there was a need, but he hadn't called upon David to fulfill it. But you and I, the Bible says that we should go and bear much fruit, and that that fruit should remain. When you read a few chapters after, Jesus comes back, and the disciples marvel and say, Master, the fig tree that you cursed is not as withered. And Jesus said, have faith in God, which means that when he speaks, therefore when you and I speak, things happen and we must believe as believers that God has given us authority. I was very worried to find that the Son of Man went to the fig tree. I thought, especially if I had to defend the fig tree, I would say, it wasn't my season to bear fruit, so you ought to have known. But this morning I learned a profound lesson. It's not about seasons, it's about being ready when the master calls and when there's a life to affect, when there's a life to touch, you must have fruit. Now, the second passage I read was about the chief priests and the elders. Jesus, the Bible says, entered the temple. So I was thinking, wow, so as he didn't find fruit on the fig tree, did he enter the temple on an empty stomach? I thought most probably. But most of us believers now, we are used to stomach Christianity. We will not, we will not go into the temple if we haven't met a certain need. Sometimes you may argue it's for medical reasons, but oftentimes it's for fleshly reasons. We are so engrossed in the flesh that the work of God, the temple of God, the things of God take second stage, if not relegated to the back. You know, but Jesus, although he had this human need, still entered the temple. Of course, the Bible is silent on whether he grabbed anything. But the Bible says as soon as he entered, he started to overturn the tables of the money changers and the sellers of doves. I mean, this was a radical Jesus. And most of us have grown up thinking, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But I came to announce to you at Easter that when he resurrected, he was not only the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God was crucified on Good Friday. But when he resurrected, he became the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And every believer has a lamb side and a lion side. Beloved, what in the world awakens the lion side on, in your life? Is it when somebody does something, you are angry and you really manifest? But did you get angry at the things of God? You get angry about the state of God's house? You get angry that it's become a, a place for robbers, a den of thieves? Do you get angry about that and do you stand radically for God, you know? Because Jesus overturned the tables. I was thinking, 
the doves were for sacrifice for some of the people who couldn't afford sheep. So somebody would have said, oh, but we're there because of you, and we came to sell because of you, so that the sacrifice of God will go on. But beloved, often what starts as Christianity, what starts as God, later on is overtaken by other things, like the love for money. We change the house of God into something else. The Bible says you and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not only these money changers and dove sellers who were misusing the temple. You and I are misusing this temple, this body that God gave to us. And if Jesus were to enter your body or your temple or your life, he will take a whip, he will crack a whip, and he will overturn the money changers and the dove sellers that you have turned his house into. He said, is it not written that my house shall be a house of prayer and yet it has been changed? It set me thinking, is God's house a house of prayer? Is your human temple a house of prayer? All these were leading up to the cross and to the resurrection. So this Easter, these are a few nuggets that God, I believe, laid on my heart this morning to come and share with you. May you get rid of the money changes, the things that have taken over our hearts, our desires, our priorities, the things that have changed our lives so that if Jesus were to come in, you have to turn it upside down. May God not have to come to that extent to get our attention. And may this temple be seen as a house of prayer. And may the kingdom of God come this Easter. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. It's time for you and I to resurrect from our ways, our deviousness, our deceitfulness. We are even able to deceive people anywhere and everywhere. We put things out there and it's all deception and we know it. And we still go on that line of deception. But this resurrection Sunday, in fact, this Good Friday, may all our evil desires be crucified. And like Paul in Galatians 2.20, may we say, I'm crucified with Christ. The life that I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. This crucifixion time is the time of the cross and we will arise and be resurrected because the same spirit, according to Romans 8, that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and I and shall quicken this mortal body. He shall quicken this temple so that we will live for his glory and be fruitful with abiding fruit till he comes. Happy, happy, happy Easter in Jesus' name.